Hey everybody, Dr. O here and welcome to the Unit 10 review. Of course, this PowerPoint will be made available to you. Look for it in the announcement. Let's get started. The subarachnoid space lies between what two layers of meninges? Is it the arachnoid and the epidura? Is it the arachnoid and the pia? Is it the arachnoid and the dura? Or is it the dura and the epidura? It's the arachnoid and the pia. It is below the arachnoid. Which fissure separates the cerebral hemispheres? Is it the central fissure, the longitudinal fissure, the parieto occipital fissure, or the lateral fissure? And it's the longitudinal fissure. Cell bodies of sensory neurons are located in the dorsal root ganglia of the spinal cord, the ventral root ganglia of the spinal cord, the thalamus, the sympathetic ganglia. And hopefully you've looked at enough pictures that you know it is the dorsal root ganglia of the spinal cord. The central sulcus separates which lobes of the brain? The frontal from the parietal, the parietal from the occipital, the temporal from the parietal, or the frontal from the temporal? It's the frontal from the parietal. What type of cells line the ventricles of the brain? You know, those open areas where there's a bunch of cerebral spinal fluid? Is it the ependymal cell? Is it neurons? Are they epithelial cells? Or is it astrocytes? Well, there could be two answers, but the best answer is ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are technically epithelial cells, but it is ependymal cells that line the ventricles. That is the best answer on this slide. The arbor vitae refers to cerebellar gray matter, cerebellar white matter, the pleat-like convolutions of the cerebellum, the flocculonodular nodes. That was a mouthful. And hopefully you said the cerebellar white matter. So when you take the cerebellum and you cut a section of it away, there is white matter that is located within there that looks like a tree. A tree, arbor refers to tree. The primary auditory cortex is located in the prefrontal lobe, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, or the parietal lobe. And hopefully you said the temporal lobe. It's really close to the ear. That one kind of makes sense. The brain stem consists of the cerebrum, pons, midbrain, and medulla. The midbrain, medulla, and pons. The pons, medulla, cerebellum, and midbrain, or only the midbrain. And it would be B the midbrain, the medulla, medulla oblongata, and the pons. Which of these would you not find in the cerebral cortex? Cell bodies, dendrites, interneurons, fiber tracts. Cerebral cortex. Well, let's think about that. Let's just start with that word cortex. Whenever we see cortex, we have to understand there's also a medulla. And in the brain, in the cerebrum, we have, um, we have the cortex and then we have the medulla. And we have to ask ourselves what's different about those structures. Uh, what's the visual difference about them? Because that's typically how cortex and medulla is defined. Well, the cortex is typically considered the gray matter, and the medulla is considered the white matter. So what makes gray matter gray and white matter white? 
Well, the easy way to answer that is to, to answer what makes white matter white. White matter is white because of the presence of myelin. And where do we find myelin? Do we find it on cell bodies? No. Do we find it on dendrites? No. Do interneurons typically have myelin? No, but fiber tracts do. We might call a fiber tract uh, an axon, or at least a fiber tract could be made of axons. So if you think through this, this question, just like I did, you can come up with the answer. The answer is indeed fiber tracts. Of the structures listed, that is the only one that will have myelin on it. The large commissure that connects the right and left sides of the brain is called the, well, you might not know what a commissure is. I'm not sure that it was included in the lecture. But there's something that connects the left and the right side of the brain. And hopefully you know that. And that would be the corpus callosum. And yes, the corpus callosum is called a commissure. And that's what connects the right and left sides of the brain. The right and the left hemispheres. Uh, this structure includes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. So the three thalamus brothers make up the diencephalon. The end of the solid portion of the spinal cord is called this, and this gives way to this other thing. So what do you call the solid portion of the spinal cord? Is it the spinal thalamic tract, the cauda equina, the conus medullaris, or the conus medullaris? Well, hopefully you know that the solid part, uh, that tip, is called the conus medullaris. And that it's going to give way. It either gives way to the sympathetic chain or the cauda equina. And hopefully you would say the cauda equina. So yes, the conus, um, the conus medullaris is the solid portion that gives way to the strands of the cauda equina. Which region of the frontal lobe is responsible for initiating movement by directly connecting to cranial and spinal motor neurons? So what part of the prefrontal lobe is going to be responsible for motor function? Is it the prefrontal cortex? Is it the supplemental motor area? Is it the premotor cortex? Or is it the primary motor cortex? It's the primary motor cortex. What is the name for a bundle of axons within a nerve? Is it a fascicle, a tract, a nerve root, epineurium? Well, the way a nerve is put together is very much like a muscle cell, and a bundle in a muscle cell is called a fascicle, and the same is true in a nerve. So a bundle of fibers um, in a muscle cell is called a fascicle, and a bundle of fibers such as axons, is also called a fascicle in the case of a nerve. Which cranial nerve does not control functions in the head? Is it the olfactory nerve, the trochlear nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, or the vagus nerve? The vagus. Vagus has some input in the throat by way of uh, sensory, taste, but it doesn't really have any control functions. Which of these physiological changes would not be considered part of the sympathetic fight or flight response? Increased heart rate, increased sweating, dilated pupils, increased stomach motility. Well, it would have to do with stomach motility. Typically, um, sympathetic response is uh, inhibitory towards any sort of digestive function. So it doesn't cause the stomach to do very much of anything. Which pairing is not correct? So this means that all of these are correct except for one. So let's look at them. Cranial nerve seven, taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. 
cranial nerve 3, pupil constriction, cranial nerve 10, taste on the posterior one-third of the tongue, cranial nerve 6, lateral rectus muscle movement. So three of these are correct, one of them isn't, which one is not? And hopefully you said C. Cranial nerve 10 does not innervate the posterior third tongue as far as taste. That would be cranial nerve 9. Cranial nerve 10 has taste receptors in the throat. The cervical plexus supplies nerve function to the head, face, and neck, the neck and arms, the arms and thorax, the upper chest and back. And hopefully you said the neck and arms. Hmm. So who's, who's supplying nerve function to the face? Good question. Which of the following is an incorrect pairing? So all of these are correct except for one. Norepinephrine dilates the pupil. Epinephrine increases blood pressure. Acetylcholine decreases digestion. Norepinephrine increases heart rate. So all of these are true except for one. And hopefully you said C. Acetylcholine actually does increase digestion. Stretch reflexes and deep tendon reflexes are examples of complex reflexes, polysynaptic reflexes, simple reflexes, interneuronal reflexes. Well, both of these are great examples of simple reflexes. What type of a reflex can protect the foot when a painful stimulus is sensed? Is it a stretch reflex, a gag reflex, a withdrawal reflex, or a, cor a cor corneal reflex? I'll get it out. It's the withdrawal reflex, yeah. Withdrawal, well, actually, most reflexes are protective in nature, but the withdrawal reflex will um, cause a body part to move away from a painful stimulus. Which statement about complex reflexes is false? So all of these are true except for one. Output may involve inhibition as well as excitation. Use an interneuron. Used for tasks that require coordination of multiple structures, require cortex input. And the answer is require cortex input. So a complex reflex can inhibit one structure while causing another structure to act, which is inhibition and excitation. It often does use an interneuron in the spine. It is used for tasks that re require coordination of multiple structures, which may involve inhibition as well as excitation, but it doesn't require any sort of cranial cortex input. That is not the nature of a reflex. Of the five components of the reflex arc, what component follows the stimulus? Is it the interneuron, the efferent neuron, the afferent neuron, or the effector? So what follows stimulus is the afferent neuron. The withdrawal reflex is an example of a simple reflex, a complex reflex, a monosynaptic reflex, or a deep tendon reflex and is an example of a complex reflex. So if we just look at the answers in this particular question, uh, we can see that the simple reflex is the same thing as a monosynaptic reflex. Typically those are true. Um, and a deep tendon reflex is also a simple reflex. So the only one that isn't is gonna be 
the complex reflex. That's just a little example of test taking strategies. In the sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic ganglia are located in the ventral root ganglia, next to the target organ, within the spinal cord, and the sympathetic chain next to the spine. So this question requires that you understand the structure of the sympathetic nervous system and maybe even be able to compare it with the structure of the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you know that, then you know that the sympathetic ganglia are going to be located in the sympathetic chain next to the spine. So then where are the parasympathetic ganglia located? Mm, just the opposite. Those are going to be, be next to the target organ. But the sympathetic is going to be in that chain next to the spine. In the parasympathetic system, the preganglionic neuron is shorter than the postganglionic neuron, is longer than the postganglionic neuron, synapses at the postganglionic chain, emerges from the thoracic or the lumbar regions. So this is the parasympathetic system. And we just talked about the sympathetic system. And we said that the sympathetic system has a chain located next to the spine, which means that for the sympathetic system, the preganglionic neuron is going to be really short because it just leaves the spine and then it synapses right there at the ganglia. And then the postsympathetic neuron is going to be really long. So the opposite is going to be true in the parasympathetic system, which means that the preganglionic neuron is going to be the one that is longer. Which statement is true about acetylcholine? So all of these are false except for one. Acetylcholine activates nicotinic and alpha adrenergic receptors. Acetylcholine is released only in the parasympathetic nervous system. Acetylcholine activates muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. Acetylcholine is the only neurotransmitter found in postganglionic synapses of the sympathetic nervous system. And the correct answer is A. It activates muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. That is true. The autonomic nervous system can either stimulate digestion or suppress it. What accounts for these two different responses? Is it the stomach is innervated only by the parasympathetic nervous system? Or the stomach is innervated only by the sympathetic nervous system? or the stomach is innervated by both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems, which is called dual innervation, or is it that the stomach is independent of the autonomic nervous system? And hopefully you said the stomach has dual innervation from the autonomic nervous system, and one of those branches will activate it and the other one will sedate it. The sympathetic system is made of nerves exiting this part of the spine, and the parasympathetic system is made of nerves exiting this other part. So let's see, sympathetic nervous system, um, let's see, is, would that be the thoracic and lumbar regions? Would it be the cervical and thoracic regions, or would it be cervical and lumbar regions, or cranial region? So I like to answer these two-part questions that way. And what about the parasympathetic? Would it be cranial and sacral regions? Would it be lumbar and sacral? Would it be cranial and thoracic? Or would it just be the sacral region? Well, you need to know at least part of this <laughs> in order to answer this question. And the correct, uh, the correct grouping is that the sympathetic regions are going to be exiting from the thoracic and the lumbar regions. So they're like, it's like the middle part of, the, of the, the spine makes up sympathetic, and then the parasympathetic is coming from the ends, the cranial and the sacral regions. So that's how I remembered that. The sympathetic chain is found right next to the, the thoracic and the lumbar regions, which means that the cranial and sacral regions are going to be parasympathetic. So let's talk about homeostatic imbalances. So Bell's palsy. This is a condition that causes sudden weakness in one side of the face. Which cranial nerve is involved? Is it cranial nerve 6, cranial nerve 5, cranial nerve 7, or cranial nerve 9? And it has to do with cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve.
You notice that your mother is starting to regularly lose her keys and misplace her mail? And that she's hired some unsavory characters from the neighborhood to help her with her household activities? And she's getting easily, uh, highly emotional without any real reason. What do you suspect? Depression, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, or Alzheimer's? Well, hopefully you said Alzheimer's. So with the Alzheimer's patient, you have a person who is having, having trouble keeping track of their things and doing uh, normal activities, like you know putting the mail in the, in the usual spot or putting her keys in the usual spot. Uh, this one where she's hired unsavory characters to help her with household activities, that shows a lack of good judgment, which is kind of inherent in an Alzheimer's patient, um, as well as that she's now having trouble with uh, some routine things and easily gets very emotional without any real cause. Again, another symptom of Alzheimer's. So all of these are pointing to cognitive decline which we see in Alzheimer's patients. What condition causes a stroke? Is it inflammation of the meninges, lumbar puncture, infection of cerebral spinal fluid, or disruption of blood to the brain? And that is disruption of blood flow to the brain. Whenever you block off a, uh, an artery to the brain, that is classified as, an, as a stroke. Your patient today has a slow shuffling gait and seems generally rather stiff. His complaint is sleeplessness. When he hands you his clipboard, his motion is unusually slow and he seems to veer to the left. And in addition, he has a slight tremor. What do you suspect? Bell's palsy, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, multiple sclerosis. And that would be Parkinson's disease. So that's that that gait, that shuffling gait, and the muscle um, uh, stiffness. Those are those are typical of Parkinson's disease. Um, it's slow motions that seem to kind of miss the mark. Also another Parkinson's um, uh, sign, and uh, that slight tremor. There's other things as a, also known as pill rolling. It's a tremor of the hands where it looks like they're rolling something between finger and fourth, uh, the forefinger and the thumb, or maybe even the middle finger and the thumb. It's known as pill rolling, but it's a slight tremor. Those are your Parkinson's, um, at least initial diagnostics. An individual accidentally transected, i.e. cut across the spinal cord between T1 and L1. That's a big range, but somewhere in the thoracic region. So what would this result in? Would it be paraplegia, hemiplegia, quadriplegia, or spinal shock? What, we're, what are we looking at here? Hopefully you said it would result in paraplegia. So the paraplegic is going to be someone who doesn't have the use of the legs, but still has use of the arms. Quadriplegia is when you lose the ability to utilize arms and legs, and that's usually because there's an, an, a neck injury. Because remember, the, the lower part of the neck is what innervates the arms. And hemiplegia would be one side of the body which might be something you would see in, uh, you know, an, an issue up in the brain. So that's a little bit about that. And with that, we are done with the Unit 10 review. Thanks for watching.